If you enjoy my work, please consider supporting me on my Patreon or on my Buy Me A Coffee page. The links to both websites are in the description of this video. One of the questions I have been thinking about for a very long time is whether society needs an external threat, a danger or an enemy threatening its existence as an ethnocultural group to keep its inner social cohesion and identity intact and its survival instincts on. In my very first video on this channel, I claimed that the reason why the post-communist states in Eastern Europe are significantly less perceptive to the postmodern progressivism that aims to deconstruct basically everything that holds society together as a manifestation of some kind of oppressive hierarchical structure is that the historical experience of these nations in the past 250 years, when their modern national identities were forged, was that of endangered nations that were facing constant threat of cultural subjugation, loss of statehood and potentially even physical destruction. And in the so far last video on my channel, I have explored the reasons why Israel can maintain a far higher fertility rate than any other nation on a similar level of development, including even the secular and modestly religious parts of its society. I have once again concluded that the biggest reason is the constant threat of physical danger threatening the Jewish state from its inception to contemporary times, creating a strong thrive for self-preservation also manifesting in higher fertility. But many other states have repeatedly brought me to think about this issue, one of them being Ireland. Ireland had been for centuries ruthlessly subjugated by the British and it resulted to the creation of a robust national identity that revolved to a large extent around the Catholic faith, which, after the slow decline of the Gaelic language, emerged as the most defining distinction between the native Irish population and their Protestant British overlords. But not that long after the British subjugation went away, after the First World War, the Irish began to strip away their deeply rooted Catholic identity and gradually, especially from the 1970s on, arrived at a point where they are maybe the wokest country in Europe. To demonstrate this point, in the newly drafted curriculum for 15 to 18 year olds recommended to the education ministry by the advisory body of the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, the pupils should also learn about how to recognize their privileged status originating, among other things, from being male and also from being white. Now, I do not want to get too deep into the culture war territory, but anyone with some knowledge of history has to see that the concept of white privilege in the context of Irish history is basically insane. Irish people were literally seen as straight out racially inferior by the Teutonic Anglo-Saxons, both in Ireland and in the United States. In Ireland, the understanding of Catholicism as a bedrock of Irish national identity that managed to help the nation get through the incredible hardship of the British overrule slowly stepped aside to the interpretation of the Catholic Church's role in the modern Irish history as a perpetrator of numerous scandalous cases of sexual and physical abuse as well as interconnections with the political power. Now, I am by no means claiming that the Church did not commit any atrocities or reprehensible deeds, since it definitely it. But is that sufficient reason to dismantle the elemental part of national identity that proved highly effective in preserving this identity through centuries of oppression? I leave the answer to you. What is certain is that after the British threat diminished and the troubles ended, Ireland became one of the geopolitically safest places on earth. One has to be really creative to come up with some legitimate geopolitical threat to contemporary Ireland, an island nation insulated from most of the flashpoints. While correlation does not mean causation, one does not have to go too far to see a certain connection there. Another example might be Poland. One of the fascinating aspects of Polish history is how the Polish identity became stronger and more refined in a period when Poland literally did not exist. Between 1795 and 1918, Poland was divided between Prussia and later the German Empire, the Russian Empire and the Austrian and later Austro-Hungarian Empire. Polish culture was actively suppressed except for a more liberal regime in the Austro-Hungarian lands and there were active pursuits of Russification and the Germanization of the Polish population. And yet, under this tremendous pressure, the Polish national identity did not disappear but arguably reached its strongest form yet. 
As in the case of Ireland, it was very firmly connected to the Catholic faith as a form of distinction from Lutheran Prussia and Orthodox Russia. It survived and even thrived in the underground, hiding from the persecution of the Russian imperial authorities and also successfully developed in exile among the Polish diaspora, most notably in Paris. Now, it is of course important to say that the Polish experience after World War I is very different from the Irish one. The most horrifying experiences were yet to come in Nazi-occupied Poland, where millions of Poles and Polish Jews were murdered in the German extermination camps and Warsaw was to a large extent razed to the ground. After that, Poland became unwillingly a Soviet satellite subordinated to the will of the aggressively anti-clerical communist Soviet empire. And once again, the Polish Catholic national identity was as strong as ever in the 1980s as the communist regime began to slowly crumble. Now, after 30 years of unprecedented peace, prosperity and security for the Polish nation, we can already observe how the Polish national identity and Catholic identity that was always firmly connected to it slowly starts to erode. What, might you ask, isn't Poland super conservative and nationalist? Well, in the European context it kind of is, but the bar is very freaking low in this regard. While the situation is definitely not as pronounced as in Ireland, these values certainly are in decline, even though the horrifying experiences of the Polish nation are significantly more recent than those experienced by the Irish. The number of young Poles practicing Catholicism declined from over 70% in the 1990s to around 25% today. The fertility rate is persistently ultra low. Now, I know the arguments for this decline of the church's popularity. It got too cozy with the political power, corruption and sexual abuse scandals went public, and the church lost its position as the ally of the nation against foreign oppressors it held throughout the previous centuries. The story is relatively similar to the Irish one in this regard. And this, of course, is all legitimate. Yet every large societal institution with a lot of power and influence will be corrupted to a certain extent. The Catholic Church definitely isn't an exception. But it is only when the external threat diminishes that society slowly starts to concentrate on the faults, crimes and mistakes of the institutions in its center that were previously held in high regard and rarely questioned. As the need to find unifying symbols reinforcing the collective identity against the enemy fades away, the questioning of the set symbols emerges. Now, one might argue that the decline in religiosity and fertility is merely a symptom of modernity, economic prosperity and an abundance of available information. Still, as I have found when researching this subject more extensively, there is much more to the thesis that I am presenting than meets the eye. So, let's get to it. Many anthropologists and ethnologists have a long time ago arrived at a simple yet profound conclusion. While Homo sapiens are a single biological species, our natural need for group identity, originating in the hundreds of thousands of years of our pre-agricultural tribal existence, means that to define this identity we need someone to define ourselves against. Since no identity is absolute, to define the in-group we need an out-group. The most effective way to designate who we are is by pointing to someone else and thus defining who we are not. More than that, many scholars, for example Adam Ferguson or Emmanuel Todd, pointed out that there seems to be a direct association between the internal morality of the group and hostility towards outside groups. It creates a paradox in the center of the human experience, in which people are often capable of their most heroic and selfless deeds, like giving life for their country or risking their lives to help civilians by hiding them from persecution, in the times when the division and hostility between the in-group and the out-group is most pronounced. The love for your own and the hate for the other seems inseparably interlinked. As Adam Ferguson, a Scottish thinker from the times of the Enlightenment, has said, quote, Without the rivalship of nations and the practice of war, civil society itself could scarcely have found an object or a form. End of quote. Similarly, 
Emmanuel Todd, a profound contemporary French anthropologist, sociologist and historian, has said, quote, Group cohesion depends on hostility to other groups. Internal morality and external violence are functionally associated. Thus, any drop in external violence ultimately threatens the morality and internal cohesion of the group. Peace is a social problem. The essential point is to understand that there is no absolute identity for any group that would be independent of its relation to other groups. France really began to exist in the 14th century only by its conflict with England. American whites exist only in relation to blacks. The Greeks were only Greeks as compared to barbarians, Christians as compared to pagans and Jews. Human societies have, of course, intrinsic characteristics, religious beliefs, family structures, economic beliefs, political organization. But none can be conceived and described without external references that give it its internal cohesion, the mobilization of the group against another, outside or inside it. End of quote. Research of prehistoric tribal societies points to the need for social cohesion and within group cooperation in the face of extermination by other tribes, leading to the ascension of human society from the clannish and tribal structures to higher forms of organization, like states and empires. So, the notion that people are purely selfish, individualistic creatures acting in their self-interest and nothing else is false. However, the more altruistic and cooperative aspects of human behavior are paradoxically incentivized most potently by violence and hostility towards other groups, both offensive and defensive. Within the community of evolutionary biologists, geneticists and other related fields, there is an ongoing debate about the contradiction between the principles of egoistic natural selection on the individual level and the human capacity for altruistic behavior and self-sacrifice in the name of a group. From the point of individual natural selection, as outlined for example in the work of Richard Dawkins, the notion of self-sacrifice for the group does not make much sense, since it makes one disadvantaged in the competition against more self-interested individuals within the society. There does emerge a theory of multi-level group selection, in which not only individuals but also groups compete against each other and the groups with more altruistic individuals with capacity for self-sacrifice tend to triumph over the groups composed of more selfishly acting individuals. These theories are not universally accepted and there is still a significant scientific debate ongoing, so we will see where the debate will go in the future, but it is a fascinating topic. American historian and mathematician Peter Turchin has written extensively about how the emergence of powerful, expensive imperial nations, what he calls imperiogenesis, most often happened in the borderlands and meta-ethnic frontiers between two different groups or civilizations. The more distinct these groups were from each other and the more hostile and mutually dangerous their relations were, the higher the probability of their imperial ascension. The harsh environment of peripheral meta-ethnic frontiers asked for very high levels of mutual cooperation and the ability of collective action, something Peter Turchin calls asabia, a term coined by an Arab sociologist, philosopher and historian Ibn Khaldun. It basically means group consciousness or social cohesion, and the characteristics that Peter Turchin prescribes to the people with high asabia are sort of gritty, tough, ruthlessly effective, military, egalitarian originating in the group's need for collective security against its rivals. As examples of the expansive imperial powers that were formed by this environment, Turchin cites the Russian Empire, emerging from the ancient frontier between the agricultural flatlands of Eastern Europe inhabited by Slavs, Balts and Ugrofinic people that got all sooner or later Christianized, and the Turkic nomadic herders living on the Eurasian steppe that later adopted Islam. The Russians experienced centuries of terror in the hands of Turkic and Mongol steppe riders, were routinely enslaved by thousands and then developed sufficient levels of internal social cohesion to go on an offensive and conquer most of the lands of their former nemesis. The typical example of the frontier mentality was the Cossacks, spearheading this expansion to the south and east from the core Muscovy lands. Another example is the North American settlers and colonizers and their centuries-long struggle against the Native American tribes, which took proportionally the highest human toll out of all the wars in American history and 
reached its harshest phase in the 17th and 18th centuries. The horrifying level of atrocities committed by both sides on a very frequent basis led to the emergence of the same collective egalitarian frontier mentality and ability for collective action among the newly forming American nation. The early Roman Empire was, in Turchin's theory, forged in its mentality by the four centuries long struggle against the barbaric illiterate Celts or Gauls, as they called them, coming from the northeast to Italy through the Alps and being the menacing other helping to form the Roman identity to be a naturally effective military machine that later helped the Romans to conquer large parts of the known world. The virtues highly held by the early Romans were courage in battle, discipline, loyalty to family, the community and the state, hard work and rejection of excess, with even the elites leading quite Spartan lives, especially in comparison with the later Roman periods. The rise of Spain to the position of preeminent imperial power in the 17th century was preceded by the centuries-long process of Reconquista, when there was for centuries a sparsely populated borderland between the Christian northern kingdoms and the southern Muslim Caliphate of Cordoba, a classic meta-ethnic borderland where the Spanish Christians gained high levels of social cohesion that eventually led to the conquest of all of Iberia and massive empire. Peter Turchin also notices how the most powerful successor states of the mighty Roman Empire all were formed on its frontiers, where the Romans kept their higher levels of social cohesion and borderland mentality. The Frankish Empire on the Rhine frontier, the Byzantine Empire in the southeast and the Arabic and Berber caliphates on the other side of the Mediterranean. In contrast, the core Roman regions of Italy, much of Greece, coastal Spain and North Africa were mostly prey to the newly emerging power of the frontiers, without sufficient social cohesion to form an expensive state themselves. The Germania Slavica meta-ethnic borderland between the Elbe and Oder rivers led to the rise of Prussia around which the future German Empire emerged on one side and the Polish and Lithuanian states on the other, which also had their imperial period when the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was the largest state in Europe. On the southeastern edge of the Germanic world, where the Germanic people clashed with the various nomadic peoples ruling the Carpathian Basin until finally the Hungarians settled there, the House of Habsburgs steadily built their Austrian monarchy. The existence of a significant and genuine external threat, the Muslim Ottoman Empire became a part of its core myth, which helped it to, at least temporarily, rule over vast number of ethnic and religious groups in Central and Southeastern Europe. And the mother of all the meta-ethnic frontiers was the border between the nomadic steppe riders and settled agricultural civilization in East Asia with China being the most common area for the creation of large empires. As we can see, the external threat, or the other, against which the in-group is defined can have many different shapes or forms. Religion, language, culture or race can be the dividing issue, depending on context. Sometimes, people speaking basically the same language and being very close to each other ethnically and to a large extent also culturally, like Serbs and Bosniaks, can dehumanize the other side to the point of becoming genocidal. In other cases, we can see the emergence of a common identity between people who would, in other environments, perceive each other as the enemy. That was the case, particularly in the United States, where the diverse group of European settlers that would often be hostile to each other on a national or ethnic religious basis back in Europe formed an inclusive pan-European white identity. The creation of this identity would likely not be possible without the existence of Native Americans and African Americans, clearly defined outgroups against which the pan-European in-group could be defined. To this day, the binary America's racial divide between black and white does not really make that much sense applied in Europe, where nationhood or religion are the most common demarcation lines. This idea was elaborated on by all authors like David Rodiger or Pierre van der Berge, who coined the term Herrenfolk Democracy. The concept of Herrenfolk Democracy describes a political system that combines political freedom and egalitarianism for clearly defined racially, ethnically or religiously demarcated in-group while being dependent on the existence of harshly disenfranchised or excluded outgroup. The level of in-group solidarity and egalitarianism within the in-group is directly correlated with the level of persecution and exclusion of the outgroup. 
the aforementioned authors prescribed these characteristics to American society in the 19th century and to the apartheid regime in South Africa. Both societies often ostentatiously showcased their commitment to the personal liberties of the free men while simultaneously brutally repressed or enslaved the African populations. What to many outsiders seemed as an obvious, cruel and hypocritical contradiction was a feature of the system, not a bug. Czech anthropologist Ivo Budil proposes that the concept of heron folk democracy might apply to the democratization process of the West as a whole. Western colonial expansionism in the 19th century created a feeling of strong cultural and civilizational superiority of Western Europeans to pretty much the rest of the world. The dual division of the world between civilized and uncivilized led to the huge popularity of various concepts of the moral civilizing mission of the European race throughout the world, the well-known burden of the white man. This creation of pan-western European superior identity might have been one of the engines of the democratization process in the colonial heartlands of the United States, Britain, France and other northwestern European states. Since if the people of the noble British or European stock are so special and capable, even the masses in these countries should not be deprived of their share of political power. This idea would seem completely deplorable to the classic aristocratic elites of previous centuries, who often loathed and feared their subjects and the poor. And the world democracy was basically a slur used in a similar way as fascism today. The growing egalitarianism in political freedoms and liberties among the Western Europeans and Americans might have been unthinkable without the existence of Africans, Native Americans, Indians, Malays and many other subordinated groups, which were clearly seen as members of an outgroup, which these newly emerging freedoms clearly couldn't include. Now, before someone accuses me of being racist or something, the theory of heron folk democracy is not meant as an adoration or an embracement of slavery, apartheid or colonization, and the authors did not mean it as such. Myself, as a dirty backward Slav, would definitely not be included among the heron folk or the noble stock, but they are, in my opinion, fascinating contributions to the exploration of the theme of this video, the effects of the clearly defined other on the well-being of the in-group. Emmanuel Todd went even further with these concepts within the American context. He proposes that the exclusion of the Native Americans, and especially the Black Americans, initially from citizenship as such, and between the Civil War and the Civil Rights era from the democratic process, was one of the crucial aspects influencing the social cohesion and egalitarianism within the majority white group. He makes a connection between the desegregation of the 1960s, the gradual erosion of the New Deal welfare state, and the meteoric rise of economic inequality in the United States. He points to the gradually rising revolt against federal taxation and, in contrast to that, perseverance of the higher local taxes benefiting directly the communities, often wealthy and white. According to Todd's division of different societies by their family types, the American family type favors inequality, since the inheritance of wealth among children was traditionally completely up to the parents' will and equality was not a factor. American society is thus predisposed to inequality. What kept this inequality in check was the in-group cohesion supported by the exclusion of the out-group, the other, in this case, the black Americans. When black Americans became equal with white Americans, the equality among whites lost its meaning. This interpretation will likely be seen as controversial, and I can see why. Emmanuel Todd is politically clearly on the left, and his views on the struggle of minorities, both in America and contemporary Europe reflected that. But he is one of those leftist thinkers that are just too interesting not to engage with. One of the intriguing things about the contemporary decline of Europe is that it neatly correlates with the increasing levels of European integration and the complete abandonment of geopolitical struggle between the former Western European powers. Not too long ago, many people were persuaded that the United Europe would be a worthy opponent of the United States and China on the world superpower stage, sort of a third pole between the two giants. The result is significantly less pompous. The contemporary European Union is an economically stagnant, demographically declining, culturally Americanized continent, vainly trying to find any impulses for future growth while being completely dependent on Americans for its security and, frankly, 
geopolitically quite irrelevant in the wider world. I have made a two-part video series about this subject, so I won't get deeply into describing the precise manifestations of this decline, but to me it is indisputable. One of the most powerful arguments of the proponents of further EU integration is that even the larger European states, and the small ones even more so, cannot stand their ground in the global competition of gargantuan superpowers like the United States, China or India. Instead of continuing in the history of never-ending competition with each other, we should huddle together and become one. While this argument sounds reasonable, the results just points to this approach not working. The fact remains that when European great powers like Britain, France and Germany were going after each other's throats, both in Europe and around the world, Europe was the undisputed center of gravity of the world in culture, economics and technology. But when, after World War II, war-torn European countries slowly decided to put their centuries-long hostilities to the side and, under American supervision, started coming closer together, this civilizational vitality evaporated. European nations lost their will to power. It is also good to point out that the decline of the EU's share of the world's GDP, as well as its innovative potential, accelerated from the 1990s on. When the Cold War ended, the Soviet Empire disintegrated and the last major threat to the Western European security disappeared. It is, in a sense, counterintuitive. Shouldn't the end of never-ending bloody and costly wars lead to unprecedented prosperity due to the amount of suddenly loosened resources previously tied up to military endeavors? In theory, it probably should, but in reality, not so much. The fierce competition between the European states, however bloody and terrible, might have been one of the sources of the Western European civilizational ascension. Now, once again, I do not want to glorify war in any way. The the horrors of the world wars reached such magnitude that one might argue that it is better to decline than to repeat them. But to me, it seems that a situation in which you are a country under the security umbrella of a foreign superpower, none of your neighboring countries even thinks of attacking you and you also do not have any intention or a desire to do so, creates an environment similar to what the universal basic income would, in my opinion, do to a society. On a personal level, the consequence of not working is that you end up really poor or maybe homeless, which, understandably, nobody wants. If you get money every month anyway, I think that every person with some common sense can imagine the results. On a country level, the usual incentive to try your best as a country and society was the fear of the other, them, the evil barbarians, whatever form they might have, getting the upper hand and destroying you. If this incentive is removed, if you do not fear the dirty, evil other coming and taking what is yours, well, what glues the society together? Why is social cohesion so important? Why would you give your life for your country? It makes no difference anyway. Nevertheless, after the Cold War ended, the sentiment of the so-called end of history was shown as illusory, and the West, instead of prophesied period of global unipolar dominance, start to become deeply socially and politically divided. What about the United States, you might ask? No relevant force is threatening the Western Hemisphere, and it has been that way for a long time. Yet, despite many quite serious internal American issues, the American system still maintains a level of internal dynamism far larger than anything observed in Europe. While the American heartland is remarkably insulated from most of the other great powers around the world, America still is, to a large extent, committed to being the world's hegemonic superpower, which is very likely a properly addictive feeling. One of the most impressive civilizational feats that humanity as a whole achieved, the exploration of space, was fueled to a large extent by a geopolitical competition between Americans and Soviets. One of the few things that the deeply divided American political classes can at least somewhat agree upon is that they should stop the Chinese global ascension and thus perpetuate its global hegemony. There is a strong isolationist streak present within American politics, today more present within the Republican Party, but also by elements of the Democratic Party, that says that America shouldn't deal with problems of the far and wide world towards which Americans have no duty, since all this involvement comes at the expense of the American people. America has a superb geographic location, abundant natural resources, 
the largest economy on the planet and the strongest military on earth. Why engage in the superpower contest regarding places most Americans cannot find on a map or properly pronounce with foreign powers that cannot really threaten America proper? We owe nothing to the world. While this argument is hard to disagree with on the surface, if we apply the logic explored in this video, the American withdrawal from the world might paradoxically result in an even more pronounced internal discord with an America, since the inner human need to demarcate itself from the threatening other would have to be directed purely inwards. In a sense, the conclusions we can draw from this video are somewhat depressing. Despite the abundance of modern technology that would make us seem like gods to our ancestors, we are still held as a hostage by the tribal mentality developed in very different times. I have thought a lot about The Watchmen by Alan Moore when making this video, since the only way to achieve unity of all mankind, as many people dream about, is likely to either experience an attack from some extraterrestrial species or to fake it, as Ozymandias Diaz did in The Watchmen. Only that would create a dangerous other common for all of humanity and thus could create a common in-group identity. Until then, we are stuck to hating each other. When thinking about countries in today's world that would fulfill Peter Turchin's pattern of high ability for effective collective action motivated by the constant threat of external danger, I cannot come to any other conclusion that Israel is such a society, since it ticks all the boxes quite well. A highly militarized society shaped by the constant danger of being wiped out by the other, in this case distinguished on an ethno-religious basis. And this, of course, goes both ways. If there is some scene where you can find a Shiite and Sunni Muslim or a Turk and a Kurd, groups that are very well capable of killing each other in different circumstances, walking side by side like brothers, it is an anti-Israeli demonstration in any western city. Let me know in the comments what other countries come to your mind in this regard. In regards to Europe, following the principles outlined in this video, the only thing that could really create some kind of pan-European identity leading willingly to a higher degree of centralization of the EU would be a credible and menacing external threat that all of the continent would be exposed to. So far, such an external threat does not exist in the classic geopolitical terms. The Russian invasion of Ukraine definitely did cause a certain turmoil in this regard. Still, I think that any kind of transformation caused by the re-emergence of Russia as a clear threat to the territorial integrity of the states in its neighborhood will be confined to the post-communist Eastern Europe. The reason is simple. Contemporary Russia just does not pose a real existential threat to anyone to the west of the German-Polish border. While you can hear politicians repeating phrases about Russia rolling all the way to Paris or Brussels, those are just phrases used for political mobilization that, in my opinion, kind of help Russia since they do not sound credible, and Russia can claim that all of the Western claims about Russian imperialism are just empty, overblown phrases. Yes, sure, we will conquer everything, Berlin, Brussels, Paris, even the moon, right? Nevertheless, to follow the impacts of this threat on Eastern Europe and especially Ukraine itself will be highly interesting. And also on Russia, of course, since Russians clearly do perceive the conflict as an existential struggle against the West. It usually goes both ways. I discussed Poland and the decline of Catholicism among the Polish youth at the beginning of this video. This will be a pretty dark idea and I definitely do not wish for anything like that to happen. But I would bet that in a scenario in which Russians would be successful in some kind of territorial expansion in Eastern Europe, and Poland would once again find itself in a war or a position of partially or fully occupied state, the churches would be pretty full very quickly. Peter Turchin writes a lot about the existence of meta-ethnic frontiers, sparsely inhabited areas between two civilizations, or ethno-religious groups hostile to each other. When considering the demographic development in Eastern Europe, especially in Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states and Moldova, the emergence of some kind of frontier borderland between Russia and the western outposts of EU and NATO is quite imaginable. As for Western Europe, I believe the highest probability of us versus them polarization will come from the inside rather than from the outside. It will revolve around the cleavages between the native populations and newly emerged immigrant diaspora from Africa, the Middle East and so on. This will likely be quite controversial and I can understand why. But the fact remains that the immigration discontent is the most powerful driving force behind the rise of the so-called right-wing populism in Western Europe in the past decade. 
the Overton window has shifted quite massively in countries like Sweden or Germany. From the Wirschaffendas approach of the Angela Merkel's Willkommenkultur in 2015 to Olaf Scholz's recent statement that Germany needs to start deporting on a large scale. Canadian demographer Eric Kaufmann, who I cite quite a lot in my videos, has repeatedly said that the mainstream liberal left practices what he calls, quote, an asymmetric multiculturalism, end of quote. It basically means that every ethno-religious group in Western countries, except the majority one, is allowed and even encouraged to uphold and celebrate its identity. However, the majority group is actively discouraged from doing so. Quite understandably, this policy is backfiring and will lead to the creation of precisely such an identity that should have been suppressed. And, of course, it might lead to the creation of similar group identities on the side of the populations of immigration background, overcoming distinctions that would separate them in their ancestral homelands. So that's it for today. To conclude, I would say that one of the main shortcomings of liberal ideology that had dominated the Western and to a certain extent the world's ideological landscape in the past half of a century is the claim that people are basically individualistic creatures pursuing their own interests and group identities are just a nuisance imposed by evil leaders to take advantage of. Well, it increasingly looks like that is not the case. In some regard, we might mentally still be just tribesmen, only with the internet and nukes.